We are crossing over. What an awesome time for Passover. Don't forget now, we have this book for you that shows the importance of Passover every year through this decade. And especially the next three years leading up to 2026 where we have incredible material written for you. A Time to Triumph is so key for you to read right now. Cindy Jacobs and Mike and I were just talking about it uh, yesterday. Now, in crossing over, I've tried to choose people who I know live by faith and move forward. And two of the people that I just admire and honor and are Peter and Tricia Roselli. Now, what makes them so incredible is this. Peter's in the corporate world, and Tricia comes from uh, an interesting, they both come from such interesting backgrounds in Jersey. If she didn't know the Lord, she'd be part of the show about the Jersey Housewives. So that shows you where they've come from. And uh, Peter, uh, Tricia is an incredible deliverance minister because she's been delivered. And Peter, of course, has incredible insight. They've got the, one of the best churches I go, get to go to, King of Kings in uh, New Jersey. And uh, I asked them to do a message for us. So we actually have two messages for you tonight. We have uh, Peter, who is talking about the importance of you knowing your identity. And we have Tricia, who is talking about how uh, Elijah, a true call to worshipers for today, how Elijah really demonstrated true worship. Now, as you get ready to cross over, know who you are and worship abandon in an abandoned way and keep crossing. Bless you. Greetings, Gloria Zion, Chuck, your awesome team from the Garden State of New Jersey. So good to be with you today. Just want to let people know that are watching, if you're not part of the Glory of Zion Network, the Kingdom Harvest Alliance, I highly recommend it. It was uh, a big shift for us at King of Kings Worship Center when we, when we aligned with Glory of Zion. And I don't think there's ever been a more important time to be aligned properly than, than today with all the things, the unexpected things that have happened to everybody in the last couple of years since March of 2020. In fact, that uh, March of 2020 weekend, when the lockdown started, Chuck had just been with us uh, the prior weekend. Um, and then, you know, who, who knew what was coming from there? So uh, we're, we're very grateful. And I know I'm going to just share what's been on my heart for the last uh, few months and what the Lord's been saying. And again, just grateful for the amount of insight that we had even prior to going into COVID. That uh, one word that Chuck gave that back in uh, Chattanooga in, in 2018, he was describing going to work in the oil fields, and uh, he, one part took him through the swamp, and he talked about what a swamp we were going to all be facing, and even said it was going to feel like a civil war. Um, so incredibly accurate warning, and that's in addition to uh, future war of the church that he wrote many, many years prior to that. So it's not like we didn't know this was coming, but you still then have to walk through it and the phrase the Lord gave me at the beginning of the pandemic was it was the perfect storm from hell because it wasn't just COVID. It was also the political issues, the election, and then the death of George Floyd and all the riots that we saw going on and, and the political decisions that were being made and the polarization that happened in our country. And you might think, well, boy, you know, as the church, how can we impact any of that? And, and I would say the church has always impacted that. And we might have drifted a little bit from understanding that we need to be connected with the culture. So in addition to the perfect storm from hell, the Lord also revealed to me that we have to first take our identity in Christ, not what our ethnic background is, whether we're male or female. And that's all the things that the culture was trying to mess around with. And it's got to be number one, right? So this is the future war of the church that Chuck talked about. It is the attempt to destroy the Judeo-Christian values that our country was built on, that was part of it at least, and then to try to confuse people about their identity, because if we can be confused about our identity, then we're going to be more codependent on the people who we think can help us. But Jesus said, look, my government is not of this world. 
of the increase of his government and his peace, there shall be no end, right? So he told Pilate, yeah, I'm here for the world, not from the world, and my people are going to be here for me, and we are those people, right? Over and over again, we're, we're given the mandate that, that if, the, if the foundations are cracked, which, you know, it says in, in Psalm 11, 3, if, if the foundations are cracked or, or they're destroyed, what are the righteous to do? And Chuck and, and the whole tribe that we're a part of, Dutch Sheets, Jane Hammond, all the prophetic and intercessory people that we look up to have been telling us all along that we cry out to heaven. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, purpose to seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. We pray, we intercede, we fast, we press in to hear the Lord, and we surround ourselves with people that are like-minded believers, not, not people that are waffling and worried about what's going to happen or worried about losing their tax-exempt status because the government's going to come in. That's not what we're about. We're about being sold-out believers in the Lord and let the chips fall where they may. If you remember, Peter was a waffling guy in the Gospels. He, he denied Jesus, and that's not who we're called to be. We're not supposed to be harmless. We're supposed to be people who stand up for the truth of the gospel and, and speak the truth. Do it in love, but be wise as serpents, gentle as doves. And this has been a shaking time. When the storm comes, like Jesus told us that we could either be on the rock or we could be on the sinking sand. And I don't know about you, but I've already chosen. I'm, I'm on the rock. I, I wouldn't even be alive today if I hadn't gotten saved. So I'm not confused at all about where my hope comes from. It comes from the Lord. I know a lot of you feel that way too. But the church drifted from our from our main course that the Lord wanted us to have. And thankfully, people like Lance Wall now and many others in our tribe were telling us a long time ago that we had to integrate into the culture. And when people in our church were coming and saying they were going to be fired, and you know we worked with these same attorneys that Cheon uh, represented him when he went to the Supreme Court. And again, that's all part of our tribe, all people that we know and we trust. And and they won in the Supreme Court. And, and the exemption letters that we were giving were being accepted by the employers because you get pushed by the devil. Sometimes you have to push back. You have to use wisdom and not get in the flesh. But as long as you're being led by the Lord, you have to take a stand for righteousness. And that's what this season has been. And there's nothing more confusing than to not know who you are. And, and, and if you, they can confuse you about your identity, even down to boy or girl, or where you should find your, your victimhood identity, then that's a big confusing problem that many of us have faced, and especially leaders that are looking to give the right advice. We're not trying to overthrow the secular government. What Jesus does is he comes in and he turns, <coughs> excuse me, we turn over the government of our lives to him. Right? It's not through violence towards the government. It's the kingdom of God within us. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else that we need will be added to us because he knows what we need. And I'll just take comfort from Psalm 73. Uh, it, it talks about the confusion that happens when you see the wicked prospering and, and you're not seeing that result yet in your life. And, and the psalmist says it so beautifully. He said, when I tried to understand all this, it was just too confusing for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then I understood their future. I understood that the wicked are going to fall. It might appear that they're prospering for a season, but no, get in the sanctuary with God. Have that personal prayer altar that Chuck's been talking about, that my wife Trisha has been talking about. So important to rebuild your personal prayer altar, to have times of worship, and not to get so caught up that you're spending all your time worried about the war in Ukraine or, or the political issues that we're all facing. Yes, be informed, but also be transformed by the power of the Word of God. And one of our recent speakers said, Spend less time on Facebook and more time with your face in the book of, of the Bible. And, you know, that's a really good piece of advice because when, when things are shaking, that's where, you're, where your foundation is going to come from to remind yourself that my primary identity is as a child of God, not an American, uh, an African, a man, a woman, whatever those different definitions the world puts on us. No, the, the primary definition is child of God. And as you know, where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. So if that's what you focus on, seeking first the kingdom, not the kingdom of this world, then that's what you're going to be. And, and there's a saying, I'm a worship leader, so I've heard it often, that you become what you worship. Whatever you worship, is that's what you become. So if you're more worried about how many likes you're getting on social media, that's what you become, a self-engaged egomaniac. No, Jesus said, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you be a servant. 
He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. So we're taking on his character and reflecting him. So just a couple of scriptures that I wanted to share with you that, that really specifically address identity and, and our identity in Christ. And, and, and for me, at least, I don't know how your background was prior to getting saved, but I didn't get saved until I was 25. We live in the Northeast here, close to New York City, which is called Sin City, uh, 35 miles from Manhattan, where we are right now. A lot of greed, a lot of mammon, worship of mammon and idolatry in this region, a lot of self-worship uh, of self. And, and Jesus straightens us out, right? Ephesians 2, 11 says, Remember, you were without Christ, having no hope, and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus. That's Peter. I'm in Christ Jesus, not far away from him anymore. I, who was once far off, have now been bought. Bought. My, my salvation has been purchased by the blood of Jesus. And it makes no difference whether I'm a Jew or a Greek, a slave or a freedman, a man or a woman, because in the anointed, Jesus, the liberating king, we are all one. So please let that ring home. Let the truth of the word of God ring home about what your real identity is. And don't be confused about that. Just a couple more verses. Romans chapter 8, verse 15 says, You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And it's that cry that our spirit, the spirit of God in us, confirms with our spirit that we are his children. And you need to confess that over yourself on a regular basis. I am a child of God, no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God, to quote the song. And then two more to go. Hebrews 2.15, it says, Jesus came to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. And if COVID has taught us anything, it's taught us how unbelievably powerful that spirit of fear is. Remember, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but power and love and a sound mind. And when you saw people, again, not to condemn anybody, but you could, there were just so many evident signs of it, walking down the street on a beautiful day, nobody within 100 yards of them, and they're wearing a mask on a beautiful day. Something's wrong. That's not the peace of God reigning in our hearts. That's a spirit of fear that's, that's hijacking us. And when we're emotionally hijacked, we make really bad decisions. Isaiah 26.3, I will give you perfect peace when you keep your mind stayed on me. So I just want to make sure that we don't forget that we have the foundation. We have the grounding in the Lord to give us everything that we need. That's what Peter said. God has given all of us everything we need. We have the ability to partake in the divine nature of God. It's Holy Spirit living inside of you. Yes, we need the word, but the word, the letter without the spirit brings death. That's what kills. And the spirit without the grounding in the word, if we're not tethered in the word, the spirit can take us into places that are not where God would want us to go. So it's within the boundaries of the word, but led by the spirit, animated by the spirit, driven by the fuel of the Holy Spirit. Same spirit that was hovering over the earth at the creation is living inside of you. Isn't that amazing? But, you know, he doesn't force his way in. You have to yield to his presence in your life and give him permission. You have to ask him to let you know what he wants you to know, not the things that you are trying to avoid. No, be honest with me, Lord. I need to know what you need me to do to change to be more like you. Second Corinthians 3.18 in the NIV says, that we are being transformed into the image of God with ever-increasing glory. Not the way the world does it, ever-increasing glory. So every day you could wake up and say, Lord, help me be more like you. Let me disappear. Let the, let the flesh in me go. I'll crucify my flesh again today and allow you to rise up in me. And last thing I'll leave you with is in, uh, in the Old Testament again, a friend of ours, Mario Marilla, who you may know, great evangelist. He talked about Josiah, and you probably know the name Josiah as one of the kings of Israel who was only eight years old when he, when he took the throne, but that his name was written by, through a prophet many, many years before, and I had never made that connection until I heard Mario talk about it, so maybe you haven't heard it, but I'll tell you because it's so important as it relates to our identity. If, if, you've, been, if you've been raised in, in a way that You've wondered about who you really are and what your mission is in life, and that's exactly what the devil wants. Then I hope this story will encourage you, right? So 350 years before Josiah is even born, which would be in 1 Kings chapter 13, a prophet comes into Israel and he recognizes the sin and the decadence that's involved, the idolatry that's involved, and there's priests that are pretending to represent God, but they're counterfeits. 
And he brings a, a word, a very strong word. We don't know his name. He's only called the man of God in the Old Testament. And this is what he said. A boy, 1 Kings 13, verse 2, a boy named Josiah will be born of David's royal bloodline, and he will sacrifice the priests of the high places upon your back. He's prophesying to the altar that Josiah, who's still 350 years away, 31 chapters later in, from 1 Kings to 2 Kings, but the word of God does not know time. The prophecy of God does not know time. The, the key part of the story is Josiah now is a young king and he recognizes that the, the temple is ruined and he wants to start rebuilding it, which is a godly thing. He's from that, that, that line of Judah, that line of David. So he's got a righteous root in him and he decides to rebuild. And as they're going through the rubble, they find the book of the law. Now, we don't know, it doesn't specifically tell us what Josiah read in the book of the law, but something that he read made him tear his clothes and repent and bring the whole country before the Lord and say, forgive us, Lord. And Mario Murillo made the point that it very well could have been that he found his name in the Bible. He read that prophecy that that man of God had said 350 years before. And that's the way I'd like to leave it with you is that your name is in the Bible. You might not see it spelled out the way you spell it, but you are a child of God because it says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and you'll be filled with the spirit of God. And you'll you'll go through that baptismal process of leaving that old life, which for the Jews was leaving Egypt and going through the Passover, the Red Sea and destroying that old enemy and taking on your new identity. And the best way to say it is you're not an accountant, you're not a plumber, you're not a policeman, you're not an Italian-American or Irish-American, you're a child of God. That's your first and most important identity. You have a spirit of adoption crying, Abba, Father. So in 2 Kings 22, which is 31 chapters later from the first time we hear the name Josiah prophesied, 350 years, he's the king, and he fulfills that prophecy by burning the bones of those uh, idolatrous priests that were imitating God, they were counterfeits on that exact altar. And the more important thing is to know that he found his name in the Bible. Many of us don't think our name is in the Bible, and that's what I want to tell you. Yes, it is, and you need to find it in there. That's why we keep telling you the most important identity is not your ethnic ba background, your gender. It's who you are in God. You are in Christ. No condemnation to those who are in Christ. So receive that today. And I just want to pray for you before we're done here and just say, Lord, I speak to everyone who's watching today, anyone who's confused and, and is concerned about the way life is going right now and the chances that they have. Let them know that you love them. We are joint heirs with Christ. Everything that belongs to the Father and the Son, we've been adopted in. And you have grafted us in to the family line of Abraham, of that covenant relationship that you made with David, that his son would come and rule and reign forever. And we are destined to rule and reign forever. I'm reminded of somebody in our church that uh, recently said to me that her life was going really badly and she was considering suicide. This is before she became a Christian. She's been a Christian for a while now. But at that time, she was ready to take her life. And I know many people are, are in that situation, maybe not watching, but you may know people that are hungry and desperate right now to find the right answer. And she said, I think I had no purpose to get up. And then when I got saved, I found out who I was meant to be in the Lord. And now I have a reason to get up every day. And I hope that's you. I hope you are like Josiah and you find your name in the book. And you recognize that there's a calling and a plan on your life. And that you will not let the devil rob from you any longer. But you'll fulfill the full calling that Jesus meant for you while you were still being formed in your mother's womb. I love you. Chuck, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm looking so forward to seeing you again. And bless you all. Hi, my name is Trisha Rizzelli. My husband Peter and I oversee King of Kings Worship Center in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. And Chuck asked uh, me to share a word that has been on my heart. And uh, I'd like to thank you, Chuck, for this opportunity. Um, a couple of things that the Lord's had in my heart, and, and, and I'm going to try to tie them in together. Um, the Lord has been really speaking to me for a couple of years about the spirit of Elijah and, and the mantle of power. And, uh, and I really believe in these end days that end times that God is releasing an unprecedented way of, of, of his power and the way we will operate uh, in, in ways that we've never experienced before. In Malachi chapter 4, 5, and 6, 
it says, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the father to their children and the hearts of the children to their father, a reconciliation produced by repentance. And it says here, So that I will not come and strike the land with the curse of complete destruction. So obviously we see in this picture that the spirit of Elijah is present here before the coming of the day of the Lord. And, and the Lord is raising up the remnant to be a mouthpiece, to be um, uh, one who confronts sin in the land and in the church. Uh, and it's not, uh, that it's not battling with fear and intimidation. In Hosea 6, it says here, Come and let us return in repentance to the Lord. Here we have that word repentance again. For he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he has bandaged us. And after two days, he will revive us. Or that word means to recover, to awaken, to restore us, to refresh us. And on the third day, he will raise us up. And that third day is resurrection power, resurrection life. I've heard a lot of teaching about that we have been for the past 10 years in third day. But I believe really now the Lord has been preparing us to enter into the third day, to, res to that third day resurrection power, resurrection life. And um, in Ezekiel uh, 37, 11 through 14, he says, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry. And that word dry means to be without moisture, to wither, to be ashamed, to be uh, confused and disappointed. My Lord, more than ever, I believe the Lord is, is, is healing the hearts of many people out of this. And it says, our hope and our expectation is lost and we are cut off. There are many that have no hope, no expectation. But see, God wants us to be a people who hope in him, who have expectation that are passionate for him, that have the zeal of the Lord that has consumed each and every one of us. And it says, therefore, prophesy to them and say, behold, my people, I will open. I'll break forth your graves and cause you to come up and arise out of that place and so you know there's a popular song that we sing get up get up get up come up out of that grave the lord is saying come up out of that place of hesitancy come up out of that place that has held you back of fear intimidation or or whatever it is that you're struggling with where you've limited god where i've limited god he's saying come up out of that place because i'll put my spirit the ruach of holy spirit we're in the era of holy spirit that we will operate in the dunamis power that he has called us to, to operate with, with that dynamite power. And it says, and you will live. And that word live is kaya. You will live prosperously. Your, your life will be nourished and refreshed. And he says, and I'll place it, it, you know, that in you over your land. And so the plan of the enemy, I mean, it's a no-brainer, has been to cause our church, the church, the ecclesia, to be a, a weak, you know, passionless uh, powerless church but see that won't ever work because he has given us the keys of the kingdom in Matthew 18 he said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church it won't happen he can try but it won't happen but for those if, if, if you've if you've fallen away because of disappointment and hope deferred and you know God is saying come on rise up again come up out of that place of stagnancy come up out of that place that's held you back because God has so much in store for us yes we're in a time of war it's tumultuous out there and that's why he needs the ecclesia to stand to know who we are in God to have that passion for him and the zeal and to know the power and authority that we truly operate in because it's what makes the difference the world is looking to a people who know their God, who have a hope in someone or something, and that there's resurrection power. He's bringing us back into the first century, you know, uh, church, restoration of church, of what it's supposed to be like. Not where we're, we're faltering between two opinions. Not where we're walking in doubt and unbelief. That's got to stop. He says, when I come back, will I find faith on the earth? So he's, there's an awakening, and, he, and we have enough in us, and some of it might be dormant, and some of these things may be dormant within us, but to, uh, to overthrow the works of the enemy, why? Because we have the spirit of the living God within us. The Bible says in, in Hosea that, that, that he said, Therefore, behold, I will allure Israel and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. The New Living says, I'll win her back and lead her into the wilderness. Well, do you think we've been in a wilderness place? 
and, 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 and so he says, and I will give her vineyards from there and make the valley of Achor a door of hope and expectation, anticipating the time when I will restore my favor on her. This place of isolation and wilderness, it wasn't all devil. And, and wilderness, I believe, has been a training ground for, for the army of God, a place where he is, um, you know, weeding out or rooting out, if I can say it that way, selfish desires, pride, fear, intimidation, anger, bitterness against one another. He's rooting that out. We've been through a, a season, a heck of a season, and, but God is saying, enough is enough. He's releasing that, that there's that, that mantle, that spirit of Elisha upon us. And in Mark 1, 2 through 4, it says, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you. Who will prepare the way? There are voices out there. We are his voice. We're in the era of pay. And we are the messengers, the envoys that are sent out to release the word of the Lord. Okay? And he's saying, who will prepare your way? A voice of one shouting in the wilderness. He, he's preparing. He's equipping. He's making us ready for the way of the Lord. John the Baptist appeared again. Here we go with a, a repentance in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. That is requiring a change of one's old way of thinking, turning away from sin and seeking God and his righteousness. Now, listen, God is raising this third day church up, but we have got to get out of where we have so much opinion about things. There's a scripture in Proverbs, and I've quoted this many times, but a fool has no delight in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. We need to express the word of God. I need to put my opinions aside and decree what the word of the Lord is saying. And so God is raising up this, this end time church, this third day church, um, you know, where we're dead to our own desires and opinions, okay? Seeking the will of God, seeking you know, Lord, what is your will? How do you want me to operate in this day and age? Not with bitterness and contention in my heart. The enemy has, has he worked a plan pretty well where he's caused so much division in the church over who's vaccinated, who's not, who voted for this one or that one. And there's been so much separation and that's got to stop because the enemy knows there's power in unity, right? So that's why the Lord is saying, look, look at your heart. Where are you at? And, and allow him to, to bring the dross, to surface it. And we're going to talk a little bit about the fire of God. He wants to deal with the stubborn resistance. Revelations 3, 14 through 18, you know, it says that an angel came to the church of Laodicea, right? And he says, and this is how it's worded in the message. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold, listen, invigorating or refreshing, and you're not hot, healing or therapeutic, and I wish that you were. He says, so because you're lukewarm, you're spiritually useless. Wow, that's from the message version. I didn't write the book. I don't want to be spiritually useless. And we, you know, the enemy neutralizes what we are to walk in through our, our negative mindsets, through murmur, complaining, and through pulling back and really allowing passivity to overtake us. And so we have to repent. Listen, all of us, we all have different issues. And so he says here, um, you know, he said, I, I've rejected you. I'll vomit you out of my mouth if you're lukewarm. And then he goes on to say, listen, I counsel you to buy from me gold that has been heated red hot and refined by fire so that you will become truly rich. And white clothes representing righteousness to close yourself so that the shame of your nakedness will not be seen. And he gives his eyes that. Listen to Proverbs 17, 3 in the Passion. It says, in the same way that gold and silver are refined by fire, the Lord purifies your heart by the tests and trials of life. Well, my Lord, do you think we've gone through testings and trials? Look at the war that, that's going on right now. There's a lot of fear that, has, that, that people are really struggling with. And listen, God wants to heal our hearts. But in this time, of trial and, and wilderness period and, and what many have been going through, the Lord is purging us. He, he's saying, let me refine you. The Lord is refining and he's bringing the gold. I mean, he's refining us as gold and silver and, and he's separating the stuff that would contaminate us, that hinders our faith, that hinders us from becoming the overcomers that God wants us to be. And he's, he's separating and he's, he's dealing with the unbelief in our heart, the doubt in our heart. And, and the pride and the stubbornness, et cetera, and the fear. He wants, to deal, wants us to address that, okay, because we are overcomers. We are more than conquerors. That's who God has called us to be. We're not wimps. That's not us. 
That's what the enemy wants you to think. He wants you to think that your words, when you decree that thing, that it won't be established. But it says when you decree that thing, it shall be established unto you. See, but when there's power, when there's that, he's bringing us to a new level, or a raise, you know, raising us up to an understanding of the voice of the Lord shatters the back of the enemy. And when we are standing in faith, and when the Lord has weeded out and uprooted the stuff that has hindered us and prevented us from really walking in, in the in the power and might that God has called us to walk in, you know, there is just tremendous breakthrough. That's what God wants us to experience, okay? 20, uh, Jeremiah 23, 29 says, is not my word like a fire that consumes all that cannot endure the test? The word of God carries the fire of purging and purifying. The word exposes stubborn resistance that prevents us from walking in victory. See, we have to get back to the the, the, the foundational principles of the word. And, and I'm sure many of you are doing this. I just know that this is what the Lord has had me rehearse over and over again. Because I don't want that anything in me would hinder me from flowing in the glory that God has for us. And what, for what's ahead. And to be that light to the people that are crying out. Light dispels darkness. You know, our Lord is a consuming fire, and he wants us to, you know, we've heard the word. Many are talking and have been. Pastor, uh, Apostle Chuck wrote about the, the altar. He has a book with Alan Mubif, too, and many are talking about the altar of intimacy. But, see, God is, is saying we, we cannot avoid that. We have to press in. It's all of our individual taking. We have to sit at his feet. And in King, uh, Song of Solomon says that, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for his love is better than wine. And that word kiss means uh, to equip with weaponry, but it also means to catch fire. So when we're in an intimate place with him, we are consumed with the fire of God. And in that place of where he's, the fire is upon us, it's, it's causing the dross to surface. All of us have it. None of us have arrived, and so it's causing the dross to surface, and I want, I want that, because the Bible says that no flesh will glory in his presence, you know, and so I want that baptism of fire, and, and we are in the era, and I believe that that Holy Spirit's coming with his winnowing fork, and I believe that fire is, is upon us for those, for whosoever will, and whoever wants it. And in Malachi 3.1, it says, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will prepare and clear the way before me. The Lord, the Messiah, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he's come, and says the Lord, who can endure the day of his coming? He said, And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner, a goldsmith melting and purging and purifying of silver and he will purify the priests that's who we are and we're, we're kings and priests the sons of Le levi and refine them like gold and silver that they may offer to the lord offerings in righteousness right so so the lord you know he's drawing us and we he has to be our first love he has to be our main focus and so with that you know, the Lord, he, he, he says, I love you too much to let you stay where you're at. We have too much within us, and he's activating, and he's awakening things that have been lulled to sleep. We can't be asleep anymore in this day and hour. The Lord has need of us. And in Esther 5.1 in the Amplified, it says, on the third day, we are in that third day, on the third day of the fast, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace opposite the throne room. The king was sitting on his royal throne facing the entrance of the palace on that third day. Listen, Esther went through her time of consecration. She allowed the firing of the Lord to take place. Twelve months of consecration, six months of it was with uh, the oil of myrrh. Merit was, they used that to uh, anoint dead bodies. Listen, she had to die to her opinion. She had to die to her ways and her flesh and her political viewpoints. And, you know, it's no king but King Jesus. She had to, to rest on what the word of the Lord says. So there was a purification. And then there was aloe and cassia. And aloe, when you, when you study that out, you know, it's very healing and soothing. But if you were to drink it, it's very bitter. And it's, it, 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 it cleanses you, let's say, internally. You know, it causes, it's a laxative. And Lord knows this end time movement, literally, will be one of deliverance. God is calling the church to rise up, get out of our religious mindsets. Anything that is limiting him, 
to hinder what he has in store for us. And so, you know, in, in, in the cassia is just, a, a, you know, I don't know, a floral a, anointing of the presence because when we get all cleansed out, we have a fragrance of Christ. So I want to encourage you with this word that the Lord is establishing his third day resurrection church, a church of power and might, but it's not without a cost. It doesn't just happen. It causes us to press into the Lord, and that's the privilege we all have. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing, and, and the Lord has just been encouraging uh, me to even allow him to allow his, his Holy Ghost scan to come upon you know, my heart, my soul, and to see where I'm at, and to see uh, you know, where am I limiting him? Where am I afraid? Where, where am I walking in intimidation? So that's not just for me, but it's for you. Because I want all that God has. I want to operate in that awakening power. I believe that he has called us to be that end time remnant. And, um, and I'll, I'll close with this. Uh, the, one of the visions that the Lord had given me a couple of years ago before the pandemic hit, I saw the body of Christ. We were all linked arms and we were crossing over this, this huge mountain. And, and we were all transparent, but what looked like in our, in our abdominal area, it, like we were, um, like it was water. And I said, Lord, what is that? And he goes, well, that's the river of living water. He says that my people are flowing in with power and might. And he says, and he says, and the transparency is because the enemy has nothing in them. And see, and that's where the Lord wants us to get. Not that we're perfect, but that we're not operating in the soulish realm. And that he has nothing in us. So I just want to encourage you with that word. I'm going to just pray. And so, Lord, I just thank you that you love us so much and that you go before us and you are awakening your children to be the people, the kings and priests, the men and women of God, to, to, to be a representation, to be ambassadors for you. And I thank you, Lord, that we are a warring people. We, I thank you, Lord, that, that we are in, uh, people who um, are in humility and who humble ourselves before you because we want to hear, we want to be directed by our King. And so, Lord, we thank you that we will be a people, we are a people who shall do great exploits for our God because we are your children and we are the army of God and that you will lead and you will guide and you will direct us and the enemy has nothing in us. And I bless each and every one of you to be the passion warriors that God has called you to be before you were placed within your mother's womb. In Jesus' name, amen.